Ultrasound Guided Tube Thoracostomy. This tutorial is designed to explain the diagnosis and sonographic characteristics of pleural effusions. It will also help bring you up to speed on the procedural related factors of the semi-active ultrasound assisted Seldinger technique for placement of a pleural drainage catheter. We won't be talking about comprehensive lung ultrasound, real-time in-plane ultrasound guidance, the blunt dissection or surgical chest tube placement technique, or the management of the tube once it's inserted. There's a few key references that help with the design of this tutorial. I'd strongly recommend any chest physicians performing pleural procedures read all three of these. So how to diagnose a pleural effusion? As you can see from these x-rays, there are some subtle features that can help distinguish between total lung collapse or a massive pleural effusion. In the ICU setting with a low quality AP radiograph in a supine patient, it can often be difficult to appreciate the subtle mediastinal shift. Under ultrasound, however, the appearance is markedly different. You can clearly appreciate that the patient on the left has a total lung collapse with hepatization of the entire lung. On the right side, you can clearly see that the patient is harboring a fairly sizable pleural effusion. Not sure what any of those terms mean? That's okay. Let's review some basic sonographic anatomy. These features should be identified anytime you're contemplating putting a tube into the pleural space. In the immediate near field, you have the soft tissues of the chest wall, comprised of the skin, subcutaneous fat, and intercostal muscles. Deep to these tissues, you have the rib shadows, which are marked by a hyperechoic line with a obvious shadow in the deep field to it. Deep to the chest wall, in a patient with a pleural effusion, you should see an anechoic space. If you don't see an anechoic space immediately deep to the chest wall, the patient may still have a pleural effusion, but it's unlikely to be accessible via a percutaneous drainage technique. The next crucial feature to identify when considering placing a chest tube is the diaphragm. This is denoted by a hyperechoic line uh, and the part of your ultrasound field that corresponds to the direction of the patient's feet, in this case on the screen right. Immediately uh, caudad to the diaphragm, you should see tissue density marking out the liver. Cephalad to this, you may see pleural, pleural fluid or the lung. In this case, the lung has a tissue-like density which we refer to as hepatization. You can see that parts of it are moving around with respiratory motion. One subtle finding in pleural effusions is the so-called spine sign. In this case, in the very deep field, you can see elements of the thoracic spine cephalad to the diaphragm. This generally would not be visible if aerated lung were in the intervening spaces. However, because the patient has hepatized lung and pleural fluid, these are acting as a conduit for sound waves to make it to the thoracic spine and reflect back to the transducer. Ultrasound in addition to identifying the presence of an effusion, can also help to characterize the effusion. And this is relevant because different types of effusions may be more or less successfully drained via a small bore percutaneous catheter. On the screen left, there's a classic simple appearing effusion. This is marked out by a purely anechoic space uh, in the pleural cavity with no evidence of septations or loculations. On the screen right, you can notice that there are multiple bizarre mobile linear structures in the pleural cavity. These are called septations or loculations and by definition make the effusion complicated. They're strongly suggestive of infection in the pleural space. Why does this matter? Well as I mentioned the characterization of the fluid has implications for the likelihood of success of drainage via a small bore percutaneous catheter. In this study Patients with different types of effusions were followed after the insertion of a percutaneous drain and the likelihood of complete drainage was measured. In cases of patients who had purely simple effusions, there was almost 100% successful drainage. In, in box C, patients with complex septated effusions, only 51% of them were successfully drained via percutaneous catheter. Box D, you'll note that the pleural fluid has multiple small hyperechoic densities in them. This is classic for a hypercellular infiltrate, which you might see with uh, malignancy. These can still be drained, albeit slightly less successfully than a simple transidate. Ultrasound is also important for estimating the size of the effusion. It's very important to take note of how large the anechoic space is uh, in between the chest wall and relevant anatomical structures that you may not want to hit with a needle.
you should generally take a measurement of this. There's a couple different ways to estimate the actual size of the infusion. On the screen left, there's a technique using a transverse orientation of the probe, that is, with the probe marker oriented perpendicular to the patient's uh, longest axis. In this case, you can get a simple estimate of the size of the effusion by measuring the uh, separation between the chest wall and the remaining lung tissue and multiplying that by 20. This will give you a volume in milliliters. However, many effusions are complex in appearance and track uh, cephalad in addition to underneath the lung. So there's other techniques that will allow you to use the height of the effusion uh, from diaphragm to the top of the chest. In this case, you would measure the distance between the diaphragm and the remaining uh, atelectatic lung segments and also the height of the effusion uh, from head to toe and multiply that by 70 to get an estimate of the effusion size in milliliters. Either of these techniques are acceptable and both have about 80% accuracy in predicting the size of the effusion. So let's get on to the technique. The first thing you want to do is find a suitable site. The external anatomy to do this is, is marked out in box A. Starting at the xiphoid, move the probe laterally along the costal margin until you're in the mid-axillary line. Place the probe down here and look at the image on the screen. It will generally look like what you see in box B. This is an area where you will have an interface between the lung and diaphragm in most patients. If you can imagine a needle coming in from the middle of the transducer in probe B, it would likely hit the liver, which would be a suboptimal result if you were trying to drain a pleural effusion. So after you've identified the diaphragm, slide the probe cephalad until you can find an intercostal space with an adequate amount of fluid with no intervening diaphragm coming into view. In box D, the person is making a mark at the lowest intercostal space where pleural fluid is visible but there is no intervening diaphragm. This is likely a safe place for a needle pass as it's unlikely to hit any intervening structures. There are different ways to position a patient for pleural drainage catheter as well. In the ICU, most of our patients are unable to sit up and support themselves at the edge of the bed, so box A is the most common uh, orientation for insertion. In patients in this position, it's often helpful to restrain the relevant arm above their head so that they're not forced to hold their arm up. The best place to put a pleural drainage catheter is demarked, demarcated by the following anatomical structures. The first is the costal margin of the fifth rib, which in most people will not have intervening diaphragm in the way. It's marked out cephalad by the base of the axilla, medially by the lateral edge of the pectoralis muscle, and laterally by the medial edge of the latissimus muscle. This has been referred to as the triangle of safety, although it's really more of a trapezoid. The advantages of using this site are, number one, that there's the least amount of muscles over this area, which makes insertion easier and pain less for the patient. Number two, in the lateral side, uh, in the lateral areas of the chest, you're much less likely to damage an intercostal vessel. This is because they have a tendency to sag down in the posterior aspects um, especially in older patients. Finally, you're generally well above the diaphragm, although you're of course going to use ultrasound to confirm this. Let's get on to the choice of tube. In the Edmonton ICUs, we have access to three different chest tubes. The Thalquick on the far left, the Fuhrman pigtail catheter in the middle, and the Skater catheter on the right. For the purposes of this video, we're going to be talking about insertion of the Thalquick tube, although we'll talk briefly about each tube in turn. The Thalquick has a few different advantages. Number one, in Edmonton at least, it's the largest bore percutaneous tube available. Note, this is not broadly true in the entire world, but it is true of what we have access to. Number two, the wire in the Thalquick kit is quite stiff relative to the other kits, so it's least likely to kink on insertion. It's also a fairly long catheter compared to the other two we have access to. This combined with a stiff wire make it the easiest to insert in someone with a very uh, wide chest wall, i.e. in the obese. There's a few disadvantages though. Number one, it's the largest bore percutaneous tube we have available. Larger bore general, generally means more pain and bigger problems if you cause a complication. Number two, because of its large size, it requires at least two dilation steps and an incision, which can be really painful if the patient isn't adequately anesthetized. Because it's got such a big dilator, there's also a potential for organ injury when you're advancing the dilator, so you do need to use caution when passing this tube. 
The next catheter we have access to is the Furman pigtail catheter. It's really small, which can sometimes be an advantage. If I was wide awake, this is probably the tube I'd want inserted into me if I had the choice. You only need one dilation because of its small size, and it's soft and flexible, so it's unlikely to bump into anything and cause damage inside the patient's body. Its advantages are also disadvantages though. Because it's so soft and flexible, it's very easy to kink off at the skin site, so you have to be careful uh, when managing it. The small diameter may also be inadequate for certain types of effusion, such as in a thick empyema, a hemothorax, or a big air leak from a big bronchopleural fistula. Finally, we have the skater catheter. This catheter does have a few advantages. Um, there are different ways to insert it, but one common technique involves advancing the, the sharp trocar through a straightened pigtail and inserting it all at once, meaning that it can be inserted very rapidly as you don't need a seeker needle or dilator. It's also kind of thrilling to just jab a very large skewer into someone's chest without any kind of guidance or anxiety. However, it stands to reason that this could cause a high rate of organ injury and malpositioning, i.e. you could skewer and biopsy someone's liver pretty quickly and not know about it until the tube was already inserted. Interventional radiologists use a slightly different technique with real-time guidance than we commonly would in the ICU, so these are much safer to be placed in their environment than ours. As a final note, the British Thoracic Society guidelines recommend that a trocar technique should never be used for a large bore drain, so this should only be used in a small catheter such as the skater that we have here. Let's get on to sterile prep and local anesthesia. You'll need chlorhexidine, gauze, a chest tube tray, a big split sheet, and a ton of lidocaine, at least 10 cc's, preferably more. Do not attempt this with only 5 mils of lidocaine, especially in an awake patient. The first thing to do is identify the desired site of insertion with ultrasound as we discussed, and then use the blunt end of a blunt fill needle with a bit of pressure to make a skin mark over the desired site of insertion. You can also use a marker, although there's been some concerns raised in the literature about the effect of the marker ink on aseptic technique. Once you've made a mark on the skin, establish your sterile field. Then inject the lidocaine skin wheel. Go through the skin wheel with the, with the needle and infiltrate a ton of subcutaneous lidocaine into the tissues. Anesthetize the whole intercostal space, trying to hit the rib margin above and below where you're going to be going. If you started with a small needle, i.e. a 1 inch 25 gauge needle, you can change it out for a longer needle with, slightly, with a slightly larger diameter and advance this towards the pleural space, injecting and withdrawing carefully as you go. Once you hit the pleural space and aspirate some fluid, take note of the depth that you hit the pleural space at when you're using your larger seeker, ne seeker needle. Dump the rest of your lidocaine and pull the needle out. Note, there are some concerns in patients with malignancy that if you aspirate pleural fluid and then inject the lidocaine along a skin tract, you can contaminate the tract with malignant cells. So I generally just dump all the remaining lidocaine into the pleural space and take the needle out, especially when I'm unsure if there could be a malignant cause of the effusion. The first step of the actual chest tube insertion is the needle and the wire. Most of the time, you're going to take your 18 gauge seeker needle and attach it to a syringe to use to aspirate fluid. In a patient vented on positive pressure, this is not strictly necessary as the patient can't really, can't really entrain air into their pleural space if they're not breathing spontaneously. For the simplicity of depiction, I've not included the syringe here. So you're going to insert your seeker needle carefully into the pleural space withdrawing constantly as you advance and being sure to keep right on the upper margin of the lower rib. This is because, as you can see, the neurovascular bundle is on the inferior margin of the rib. Once you hit the pleural space, you're going to get a return of pleural fluid, either into your syringe or draining spontaneously out of the needle if you're not using a syringe. At this point, stop and advance the needle a little bit further. A couple millimeters will suffice to ensure that the bezel of the needle is completely within the pleural space. Recheck that you have free drainage of pleural fluid. Now carefully stabilize the needle and advance the guide wire into the pleural space. You should not feel any resistance. The wire is likely to hit either a mediastinal structure, the diaphragm, or a piece of lung, and at that point you'll feel a bit of resistance. You should stop advancing the wire at that point. You can then withdraw the needle, leaving the wire in situ. If you're using a kit that has a syringe, such as the Thalquick, make a little nick at the skin site along the wire. 
Next is dilation. Take the dilator and run it over the wire until you hit the skin surface. As you begin to insert the dilator into the skin, advance with an assertive twisting motion. You don't need to insert the dilator all the way, just deep enough to get through the pleural space. If you're using a Thalquick kit with multiple dilators, do this fairly quickly in sequence. Once the tract is dilated, you can advance the tube. Advance it into the pleural space, being sure that every single hole on the tube enters the patient's body. You don't have to insert the tube all the way in, but it is crucial that all of the side holes be completely within the pleural space. You can advance the tube gently and carefully, uh, and stop advancing if you feel any resistance. You can then withdraw the wire. You'll note that the Thalquick tube has this strange plastic thing inside of it. This is just designed to help the tube slide more easily over the wire and to stiffen the tube as it enters the patient's body. Once you've advanced the tube to a satisfactory depth, you can take out the plastic inner lumen and the wire all at once, leaving the clear plastic chest tube inside the patient. You're done. Or not. There's one last important step, which is to suture the chest tube into position. I don't get fancy with these, especially for the small bore drains. I tend to just put one stitch near the wound, tie it somewhat loosely so there's a little bit of slack between the between the patient's skin and the knot, and then wrap both ends of that of that thread around the wire. I don't do any fancy Roman sandal or other types of techniques, just wrap it around the tube a couple times and tie it down tightly enough that it makes a slight indent into the tube. With your really small floppy tubes, it is possible to completely kink off the tube with this, so don't wrap it too tight. Once I've done my knots, I give it a couple yanks to make sure that the tube is secure, and then I use my dressing of choice to finish fixing the tube in place. At that point, I will hook it up to a uh, water seal drainage system. It's happened before that if you attach the tube to the water seal drainage system before it's been sutured in place, the weight of all the additional tubing can slowly work the tube out of the patient's pleural space. So I think it's best to hook it up once it's fully secured. I'll also mention that while you're suturing the tube into position, the tube should be clamped or occluded so that you're not entraining air into the patient's pleural space. As a final tip, I tend to use a big ass silk stitch for tying the tube in place. There's a couple of reasons for this. Number one, when it's pulling on the patient's skin, it's less likely to actually rip through the skin than a really uh, thin suture. Number two, when I'm tying it tightly around the tube, sometimes a thinner stitch like a 3O or 4O proline can actually snap. So I prefer to use the silk because of its superior tensile strength. So that concludes the video. Ultrasound is a useful adjunct for the diagnosis and management of pleural effusion and helps to make the insertion of uh, percutaneous drains safer and more successful. It can also give you information about how likely it is that your, your effusion is going to drain successfully with a small bore drain. I'll also mention that we recommend the ultrasound assisted technique as opposed to real-time guidance. There's many reasons for this, but as a general rule, the major benefit of ultrasound in this technique is identifying structures and organs that you would not want to hit with a needle. And this process is well served um, with the ultrasound assisted technique alone. Trying to do real-time guidance involves additional task complexity and often requires an extra set of hands to help you with managing the probe. So we reserve that for advanced practitioners only and in certain situations like when there's a very small pocket to be accessed. Thanks a lot. This concludes the video.